Congratulations. It's also refreshing to see two um, female fortune engineers, and uh, this is great. Uh, I'm very familiar with the Transmillennium in Bogota. I have taken ridership in the one in Mexico City, in Guatemala, Buenos Aires, Curitiba. And the only one I haven't taken, but I have seen a lot, is the one in Miami. Actually, we do have a BRT. It's on, along uh, Dixie Highway. It goes south. It's totally useless. Um, but that's, not, that's a commentary on, on our system here. And that's because we have, it's very costly, and, and, you know, at least in Miami, and most people have cars, and it doesn't go where we, people want to go. So it's always empty. Well, every time I saw it, it's empty. But I have taken, as I mentioned, the one in Mexico City and, and Transmilenium in Bogota, that's the first one, and Buenos Aires. And they're superb systems. The questions that I have, I'm not familiar with Avenida Independencia. Uh, most systems are implemented on existing roads. So you have to have dedicated lines. The question is, is there a frequency that justifies such an investment for dedicated lines? Because you wouldn't be taking that from the rest of the public. So if you have like Buenos Aires, where you have about 10 bus lines competing in the same route, there's one every about five to 10 seconds, not minutes, then it's perfect sense. In Bogota, it's about five, three to five minutes at most. That makes sense. I don't know if, the, um, in, in, if you have any, done any research uh, since you've been there, whether this, um, the amount of uh, space that you're going to be taking for the general public will be justified because of the frequency of the transportation of the people. So um, the road that we chose at La Avenida, um, I believe, was a had three lanes on going northbound, three lanes going southbound. So our idea was to widen it a little and to use the innermost two lanes as the specific bus lane and to put the um, platform or the shelter in the middle. And so um, I think there aren't, um, while we were there, there was traffic at certain times of the day, but it wasn't traffic like you would see rush hour here. So I think if we were able to implement this system and we were able to encourage or maybe like incentivize more people to take those buses instead of driving from point A to point B to get downtown, they could just take the bus and do that, and maybe that would also lessen the amount of cars on the road. So I think it could, um, or I don't think it would take away too much from the current drivers. Your observation was that most people actually take the private car rather than the buses. Thank you. No, our observation was there were, and speaking with our professors who worked at Kuhai, they were taking, it was taking up to three hours just to get to work in the morning as they would be running late. So we felt that really anything more high speed versus the stop, stop, stop would be beneficial to the public as they would be there quicker. And that's how we. So it would be a system that actually would take just to skip some stops and go to the general stops? Yes, it is designed to have more link length in between because if you have too many stops you might as well just take the regular bus that stops every block or so. And also um, part of the BRT systems involves creating a certain corridor so um, I know when I was doing some research on Miami's um, they have like a southeast corridor that goes down a specific lane and a northeast corridor and so and so uh, our corridor would hopefully go, um, so as we mentioned, our professors at Kuhai had to travel a ridiculous amount of time to get to work. So perhaps there would be a specific corridor going from a certain area um, and going past places where they might live just to Kuhai, or not just to Kuhai, but going out to that area and then coming back in to increase efficiency. Congratulations, and I'm glad to see two females in transportation. <laughs> okay, that's outstanding. Um, bus rapid transit, and it is near and dear to my heart. And my first question, I think you may have answered it, is when you picked Avenida Independencia, did you compare what, the, what you were solving, the, the speed issue? Because bus rapid transit, typically, you're taking a lot of people from one point to another. And like you said, I think in your answer, you don't want to stop. But the question to you is, did you consider the cost benefit of separating a lane and dedicating the lane versus just running 
express bus service. Uh, just changing where you pick up one bus and you go stop and the other one is express, rather than all of the infrastructure uh, uh, changes. We didn't look specifically into that, um, mainly because we were looking for, I guess, just newer systems to implement. And uh, we had some guidance from our professor, uh, Dr. Stephen Jones, who's also very, um, who's also um, very supportive of BRT implementation. And so we kind of just ran with that idea. We tried to do, um, as you saw our cost or economic impact um, on our slide, we tried to do a sort of cost benefit analysis, but it would hard to really, or it would be difficult to really ascertain the benefit of a system like that unless you had accurate, you know, cost projections or, you know, five years down the road, you were able to see that it worked or if it didn't. I am a huge fan of BRT, just so you know. And what intrigued me about your paper is that in thinking of a new Cuba, new Havana, and the opportunities for economic development, and then you look at your research and you see that there is a 0.03 cars per person there's a tremendous opportunity to develop a transit system in Havana that is non-car dependent, rather than what most people do, which is try to retrofit a city away from car dependency, and then it becomes the challenges that Dr. said. Um, so that was what intrigued me. That's why I asked the question. There, there's steps to it, but I'm a big fan of BRT, and congratulations. Mm -hmm. Can I add something? Okay, so also we observed, this is also why we decided to do the full kind of re-infrastructure on what exists is, because as of right now, tourists just don't take public transit. And so I, we thought it would be a very reliable investment as even while we were there in the two weeks when they allowed the first cruise ship from America into Havana, like tourism was just insanely peaking. And so it's just a matter of time before it's overflowing with tourists and it's just, it has huge potential. It's gonna be easy. Okay, <laughs> it's close to lunch. Uh, being familiar with traffic in Latin America, uh, I ignore in Havana how many traffic signals you have in your routes. But did you consider some type of sensor that will turn those lights to allow the bus to transit from one point to the other as fast as it could? And God willing, do they obey the, <laughs> the traffic lights? Um, that was something we thought about because we also noticed there that sometimes traffic rules were more of suggestions as opposed to actual rules. Same here. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so we, we did consider that and we kind of thought of it actually because we were thinking about what to do for people who wanted to turn left out of the lane if there was a bus lane going through. So we decided um, that there would kind of be a delayed signal so the bus would be allowed to um, go first through the state, or not the station, would be able to be allowed to go first through the intersection and then all the other cars would be able to turn, would be able to go when the light turned green. I think that's, that's important in getting from one place to the other in a timely manner in Latin America. <laughs> Again, congratulations. Uh, something that, that I didn't see and you didn't present here either is cost per ridership. Because uh, with the wages that are being paid in Cuba, uh, I don't think I don't think this would would work for the for the Cuban public. Probably would work for tourists. I just wonder if you did any of those studies. I think that. Um, in time, well, since these are specific corridors that, estab that are established, obviously they don't go everywhere like the current bus system or the current bus infrastructure would, but I think um, the fares that um, the average Cuban citizen pays for 
uh, the normal bus could also be the same that they would pay for this bus rapid transit and this would just take the place of um, the bus that they would normally take. And our hope too was to take the buses that they already have and attempt to retrofit them for this bus rapid transit purpose. So in that case, we could take some of the buses away from those routes um, that already exist and put them into this BRT corridor to help. And another solution we discussed, which is, it was kind of hard to depict right now as the kook changes every time you visit, would be to charge tourists more money to ride using the kook versus the Cuban peso. And they would get kind of a discounted rate until it paid for itself and then you could break it even. And so that would just require so much research that we didn't have the data for and with the currency changing so much, but that was something we investigated on that. I want to share her thoughts because for, for all of these teams, so, yeah. for, for all of these teams, one of the main things I want to, I do want to comment on, and as this process goes, when we started with 30 uh, participants and 30 letters of intent back in, in October, one of the main hard uh, or downfalls is that we don't have any specific data on Cuba. We don't have the um, intellectual um, knowledge that they, nothing, nothing is in the public sector. So if you're looking at waste generation or water pollutants or any, any of that discharge, it's pretty difficult to look at, uh, at those numbers. And I think the work that those six teams and, and all of the others that submitted a, a report were able to compile based on the data that is available in looking at, for example, uh, mimicking a Puerto Rican waterfall to Cuba or water um, system is certainly what we expect to do uh, because we don't have any of that data. And again, some of these projects we're looking at, it's not necessarily feasible to integrate it into the current government. Uh, I know we mentioned some of the biochar that the Cuban government is developing right now. The hope is that that does move on forward and they could potentially integrate it in a more free and economically different um, government. So thanks again for everybody that uh, presented the top six teams. Uh, at this time, we will take a break for lunch. So those of you viewing, we'll be back at 1 p.m. for the award ceremony. Um, so stick, a, stick around with us. We'll take a quick short lunch break and for all of those in the room, I would like to, for everybody, before you go to the food, we'll do a five minute, no more than five minute, we promise. We wanna take a group picture to make sure that we save this moment and, and keep it with us. So if you can walk out those back doors and we'll uh, meet outside before we get lunch, and then we'll come right back at one. Thank you.